I've heard all sorts of bad negative things about the Sharia. What is it really? Is it as bad as I've heard it? Islamic Sharia or Islamic legislation regulates the relationship between a ruler and his people and it regulates the relationship between the people themselves as well. Sharia is more about human rights than it is about punishments. There are basic human rights that Sharia or Islamic legislation ensures for us. One of these is the right to safety and it is actually mentioned in a saying of the Prophet peace be upon him in which he said, whosoever begins the day feeling family security good health and provision for his day is as though he possessed the whole world. So personal safety and security are basic human rights in Sharia. It is the duty of a ruler to provide safety for the people over whom he rules. Another right which is also mentioned in the same saying is the right to good health or in modern day terms, the right to health care. There should be no person who is in need of a certain medication or medical treatment, but is unable to afford it. He must be covered by a national health care umbrella. The third basic right mentioned in the same saying is the right to daily sustenance. There should be no person going to bed hungry because he has no money to buy food, whether it is because he is unemployed or because because the breadwinner in the family has passed away. Social security benefits for the unemployed, for the elderly, the disabled, for widows, and for orphans is a basic human right in Sharia. Every year I meet with a group of non-Muslims in England to talk about Islam. In 2008 they asked me that my talk be about Islamic Sharia. That was a very hot topic in Great Britain at that time because Archbishop of Canterbury, Reverend Rowan Williams, had just proposed that Muslims in Great Britain be allowed to implement Sharia within their personal affairs. Inevitably, there had been a great uproar following his statement. When I started my lecture, I asked those present what the first thing that came to their minds was when I said the word Sharia. They smiled and said that it was the cutting off of hands, of course. So I told them, but Sharia does not only prevent stealing, it also prevents securitization and selling debts for debts. These are the two financial practices common in the stock market and they were actually the two main contributing factors that led to the financial crisis of 2008 at that time. So if the West had made use of Islamic Sharia regarding these two issues, millions of people would not have lost their jobs in the United States and Europe. Some years ago in the United States, I did a study comparing between the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights and between the Quran. The United Nations Declaration of Human Rights was declared by the General Assembly in 1948. That was on one hand. And on the other hand, it was the Quran. For this purpose, the Quran was being examined merely as a declaration of human rights that had preceded the United Nations Declaration by 1400 years and not as a divine word from God, simply as two declarations of human rights an old one and a new one being assessed in a comparative study. I found out that all of the human rights mentioned in all the 30 articles of the United Nations Declaration had been mentioned in the Quran. I also found some other human rights that are mentioned in the Quran, but not in the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. The right to divorce is one example. The right to marriage is present in both the United Nations Declaration and in the Quran. But what if someone makes a bad decision in their choice of a spouse? According to the United Nations Declaration, the right to divorce is not mentioned. And so nobody gets a second chance. And couples may just have to keep fighting until one of them throws the other one from the window. On the other hand, in Islamic legislation, although putting an end to marital life is undesirable, and should only be resorted to when all efforts to salvage the marriage have availed nothing, it is a basic human right for both men and women. The right to inheritance is another right that was not mentioned in the United Nations Declaration. And there are many other human rights as well that were not mentioned, such as the right to self-defense, which was not included in the original United Nations Declaration, but was added later in 1966. Now, let us ask ourselves a question. Why is it that the old Declaration of Human Rights, the Quran, 
is more encompassing than the new declaration, that of the United Nations. Mind you, it is not 50 years or so older, it is 1,400 years older, yet it is more comprehensive. The reason is that each system assumes the characteristics of its maker. So anything man-made is liable to imperfections, since human beings are themselves imperfect and therefore fallible. It may very well be marvelous or ingenious because there are some marvelous and ingenious minds amongst people, but it will never be flawless because man is simply not perfect. On the other hand, anything divine is perfect because perfection is a characteristic of God only. Now the question is, how do we deal with Sharia? How do we make practical use of it? To begin with, we must accept the fact that Sharia is to be applied in its entirety only in Muslim majority countries. It is not for a minority of Muslims living in non-Muslim countries to thrust it upon the non-Muslims. However, Muslim minorities living amongst non-Muslims can demand their right to apply personal dimensions of Sharia within their lives. Here I am referring to such aspects of Sharia which concern their day-to-day -day lives, such as the right to pray five times a day, the right to wear the clothing and eat the food which is prescribed in Islam, not however to attempt to enforce the penal laws of Sharia for example. Likewise, Muslims should not stand on the streets of non-Muslim countries in the name of da'wah scare mongering with their ranting and raving about how sharia law will eventually dominate the world. Such brutish behavior is not from the sunnah of our prophet and instilling fear in people can never be a means of da'wah. On the topic of implementation of sharia in Muslim countries, first of all, the expression implementation of sharia is not accurate. A more apt term would be governance of Sharia or governance through Islamic legislation. The Quran used the expression absolute governance is only for God, meaning that only God rules. It did not say only God's laws are implemented. The Quran also says, do they want to be governed by the ways of pagan ignorance? It did not say, do they want the laws of pagan ignorance to be implemented? So it is more proper to say governance by Sharia. Now, what exactly is the meaning of governance by Sharia versus implementation of Sharia? Sharia or Islamic legislation is a platform of legal foundations and the lawmaker should make use of that platform by writing laws that conform and adhere to it. But the law itself with its phraseology and details is derived from society, from people's lives and their circumstances. So basically the role of Sharia is to say whether or not this particular law or that particular law is permissible or not. In other words, if it is halal or haram. However, that doesn't mean that any law that conforms to Sharia is automatically successful or suitable. It may be unsuitable for a particular society or for the era we live in. But the blame here does not fall on Sharia. Rather, it falls on the lawmaker who formulated the actual law. He wrote it in a way that is unsuitable for the present time. I will give you an example of the role that Sharia should play in lawmaking. In Egypt, up until about 40 years ago, there was a law called the law of inheritance. When someone died or left an inheritance, the government levied a tax of around 42% and the heirs share out the remaining 58%. When Islamic Sharia became the main source for legislation in Egypt, this particular law was revoked because it was in conflict with the clear stipulations of Sharia. The Prophet peace be upon him said, whatever a deceased person leaves behind is for his heirs. That this means that whatever money or property a person leaves behind belongs rightfully and fully to his heirs and the government has no right to have a share of the inheritance. So do you think this law was successful or not? Don't jump quickly to the conclusion that it was unsuccessful because actually from the point of view of the Secretary of Treasury, this was a very successful law. It brought in a lot of revenue for the government. But on the other hand, from the point of view of people and of the heirs, it was unsuccessful because it deprived them of what was due to them. 
Here comes the role of Sharia. It acts as an arbitrator and determines that despite the fact that this law is of benefit to the government, it must be revoked because it is biased and unfair. It does not conform to the foundations of Islamic legislation. This is the crux of the matter. We should avoid over analysis of the concept of Sharia. We should not regard it as a set of cut and dried laws, but as a foundation for Islamic legislation. Undoubtedly, God will grant us blessing if we adhere to his regulations, but we should follow the necessary steps for success in this matter. We must, in a Muslim country, make laws that are suitable for the nation as a whole, so that these laws conform to the foundations of Islamic legislation, but are also successful and functional. Why should Muslims in Muslim countries abide by Islamic Sharia anyway? Well, the answer is simply because they are Muslims. And the word Muslim means one who submits to God. We could ask why we should adopt foundations of French legislation or Anglo-Saxon legislation for that matter. God's decrees are perfect and complete and are the most suitable for human beings, whereas the laws of any nation are derived from the nation itself and are influenced by its origins and its culture, its beliefs, its morals, and its traditions. Why should we set aside God's directive for legislation and follow the changing customs and ethics of mere humans. That would definitely not do. Next, we come to the issue of non-Muslims who live in Muslim countries. Actually, Islamic Sharia grants them the right to implement their own legislations in their personal affairs, so they are not forced to conform to legislation that is not their own. Nevertheless, many of them, such as the Christian Copts in Egypt, opted to have the articles of Islamic Sharia implemented in some of their personal affairs, such as inheritance, for example, when they found that they were fair and beneficial. Another issue which arises is concerned that if any nation decides to start conforming to Sharia, problems will arise due to the sudden shift from secular laws to Islamic law. We can avoid this problem by making the shift gradual and in fact one of the characteristics of sharia is gradual adaptation incidentally the caliph omar ibn abdul aziz who is considered the fifth of the rightly guided caliphs had an overzealous son who reproached him for not being more abrupt and decisive in adopting sharia omar response to his son was my son god declared his disapproval of wine on three occasions in the Quran and then prohibited it on the fourth occasion. I'm afraid of coercing the people into what is right suddenly lest they reject it all at once. So if a nation chooses to adopt God's guidelines, then a group of specialists should formulate a time plan to gradually change the present secular laws. The most important thing in the matter is to have the will and to have confidence in ourselves and in what we possess. We should never fall prey to feelings of inferiority or to the assumption that the West always knows best. And we should refrain from following others blindly. Lastly, since the punishments of Islamic legislation have been mentioned earlier on, I am obliged to elaborate on that topic. The severity of Islamic penal law is unarguable. Nobody can try to suggest that the punishments prescribed by Sharia are not severe. However, when one studies the rulings of its implementation, they find that they were set in place not to be meted out, but rather to deter and to ensure the safety of society as a whole. And when practiced correctly, they achieve those endeavors more effectively and with more justice than any other set of laws that can be compared to them. It is an immense topic, one which has been discussed in a previous episode. At the end, we need to know that God is the most wise and that following his rulings will not bring to people except everything good in their life. Thank you.